The church is the enemy of knowledge and learning, her opponents say. Well, then why did she give birth to the university system? It's another forbidden question. Welcome to the Catholic Church, builder of civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. This week we're going to be talking about the development of the university system and the spread of learning throughout Western Europe, which are developments that are typically thought to have taken place rather in spite of the Catholic Church instead of because of it. But as usual, we're here to overturn the conventional wisdom. Now, for a long time, it was said that a dark age descended upon Europe with the rise of the Catholic Church to prominence following the decline of the Roman Empire. That for a thousand years, there was nothing but backwardness and darkness in the West. We've perhaps all heard this. But today, more and more, we see historians are scaling back the time period that they would designate as dark. No one in his right mind refers to the thousand years from the late 400s to the 1400s as dark. Only a lunatic would call, for example, the 13th century dark. In fact, there was a great book written once called The 13th Greatest of Centuries. Hmm. Now, it is true there, were dark, there was a dark period after the fall of Rome. There was a time where education declined, culture declined, civilization declined. But was that the fault of the Catholic Church with barbarian groups in control politically of various parts of Europe? Was that the Church's fault? Now, it's interesting to note what historian Will Durant said. Now, who is Will Durant? Why do we care what he said? The interesting thing about Will Durant is not only that he wrote a zillion books, he was the Stephen King of history, he seemed to be writing, sitting at his typewriter 24 hours a day. What's significant about Durant is that he was an agnostic. He had no dog in this particular hunt. He was not out to defend the Catholic Church, and sometimes he could be kind of vicious toward the Church. But even Will Durant understands that it's not fair to blame everything that goes wrong in Western Europe on the Catholic Church. Durant said, the basic cause of cultural retrogression was not Christianity, but barbarism, not religion, but war. The human inundations ruined or impoverished cities, monasteries, libraries, schools, and made impossible the life of the scholar or the scientist. And then he says, perhaps the destruction would have been worse had not the church maintained some measure of order in a crumbling civilization. Well, even in the midst of the crumbling, the church did everything she could. And on another episode, we will look at the role of the monks. The monks did so many things, we should have a hundred episodes on them. We'll have one, but that's for another time. For now, let's note that in the 8th century, in the 9th century, Catholics are going out of their way, Catholic bishops, to build schools. Charlemagne, the great emperor of the West, ordered the various cathedrals to open schools, as I mentioned in a previous episode. After Charlemagne, ninth century bishops and local church councils called for the opening of schools. This was the great age of the copying of Latin manuscripts from the ancient world. Kenneth Clark is the author of the great classic book called Civilization, and he says this. He said, people don't always realize that only three or four antique manuscripts of the Latin authors are still in existence. Our whole knowledge of ancient literature is due to the collecting and copying that began under Charlemagne. And almost any classical text that survived until the 8th century has survived until today. Well, there's something to credit the church with, don't you think? In fact, the 8th and 9th centuries saw the beginnings, the beginnings that were unfortunately snuffed out, of a kind of cultural revival that was known as the Carolingian Renaissance. And here we saw the attempt to bring back learning and culture. And we see, for instance, the copying of manuscripts, which is important. We see, in addition to that, the development of something called Carolingian minuscule. Carolingian minuscule was a kind of writing. Before the existence of Carolingian minuscule, you would see writing that had only capital letters. And if you ever get an email from somebody who sends you an email in only capital letters, and you just can't bear to look at it, you know, who is this barbarian writing to me in all caps? It's annoying, it's hard to read, it takes longer to write. 
They also had no spaces between the words before Carolingian minuscule, no punctuation. So imagine just a big block of capital letters. That's a lot of fun to read. Beyond that, because of geographical isolation, people in this part of Europe, rather than this part of Europe, would develop their own script that was largely indecipherable to people from another part of Europe. Whereas it was monks who helped develop what was called Carolingian minuscule. Minuscule because it introduced the idea of lowercase letters. It also introduced spaces between the words, punctuation, and it constituted a single script, a single standardized kind of writing so that people could travel throughout Western Europe and could understand each other. Well, that's no small contribution. That's one of the great contributions to the cause of literacy in the world. And that came out of this Carolingian Renaissance. Unfortunately, the Carolingian Renaissance died a premature death, largely because of more waves of invasion by still other barbarian groups. The 9th and 10th centuries, the 800s and 900s, saw wave upon wave of invasions by various groups, by the Muslims, by the Magyars, and by the Vikings. And these waves of invasion were devastating to the West. Monasteries were sacked and destroyed, as were centers of learning. Now, Western Europeans were often very, very good fighters. But they also tended to be very slow to organize. So by the time they could get themselves together, the raid was all over and they'd been sacked. And this happened year after year. Well, it's not the church's fault if it's hard to maintain civilization when the Vikings are attacking you every single year. And when we consider that one of the best known of these attackers was a man named Thorfinn Skull Splitter, we can get a little flavor of what this must have been like to live at that time. And yet, the monasteries of the Catholic Church had incredible staying power. They were among the most resilient institutions that ever existed. Because you can destroy one of them, but there are still hundreds more. And even if you destroy all but one, the one can restore the culture. Christopher Dawson was one of the great Catholic historians of the 20th century. For a while, he taught at Harvard. That's never going to happen again, but Christopher Dawson taught at Harvard. And he said, among other things, he said, 99 out of 100 monasteries could be burnt and the monks killed or driven out, and yet the whole tradition could be constituted from the one survivor. And the desolate sites could be repeopled by fresh supplies of monks who would take up again the broken tradition, following the same rule, singing the same liturgy, reading the same books, and thinking the same thoughts as their predecessors. Well, if you want to revive a civilization, having monasteries around uh, certainly doesn't hurt, does it? So the monasteries, as we'll see, as I say in another episode, played an indispensable role. They could, no matter how many of them you destroyed, it could start all, up, uh, all over again because of the remnants. Now, historian Lowry Daly once said, that the Catholic Church was the only institution in Europe that showed consistent interest in the preservation and cultivation of knowledge. Isn't that surprising to hear a historian say that? The Catholic Church is the only institution that's consistently interested in the cultivation and preservation of knowledge and the pursuit of truth. Well, it so happens that that institution, the Catholic Church, did more than any other institution to give birth to the university system in Europe. The university was a unique creation of the High Middle Ages in Europe. And when we say High Middle Ages, we typically mean perhaps 1150 to 1200 all the way to perhaps 1350 or 1300, that, that time period. And it's an extraordinary time because, as I say, it gives birth to the university system. How could you call an age dark that gives us the universities? Now, where did the universities come from? All different sources. In fact, they come from, on the one hand, some of the universities, uh, some of the cathedral schools. The cathedral schools that were built and encouraged by Charlemagne and later bishops, some of them turned into universities. Others, other universities got started as informal gatherings of scholars that eventually built up the infrastructure of a university. And we can't identify with exact precision a date that they got started. But certainly we can say that by the latter half of the, 1200, of the 12th century into the 1200s, the universities are getting going. 
and you start to see some of the great universities of the Western tradition. You start to see, you see the birth of Oxford and Cambridge and Paris and Bologna and the medical school at Salerno. These places are 800 years old and older in some cases. Ex this is an extraordinary advance. And what institution made it possible? Not simply the Catholic Church, but specifically the papacy. Henri Daniel Rops was a French historian in the 20th century who said, thanks to the repeated intervention of the papacy, higher education was enabled to extend its boundaries. The church, in fact, was the matrix that produced the university, that nest whence it took flight. The popes, for example, chartered more universities than anybody else in Europe. 